diabetes, that the vast majority of what we do is take care of ourselves and our families at home, and that the great, uh, the biggest obstacle to our being able to do that well was uh, access to information. And when the internet came along, he saw that that would alter what was possible. It wouldn't make me, I mean, I'm a patient who worked in high tech, I'm a, a cancer survivor. It wouldn't make me an oncologist, but it would give me access to information and other people that had not been possible before. And at the time of his unexpected death in 2006, he was working on a manifesto funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's pioneer portfolio. Robert Wood Johnson is the, the original funders of Open Notes. Uh, and of all the many amazing people mentioned in that report, which people like Danny Sands and others finished after Ferguson's death, the only person mentioned in that report who's here today speaking is our next speaker. Uh, and for the, if you're at all like me, I'm going to give you a gift that is worth your price of admission. I'm going to say how to pronounce his name, <laughs> which is Rashika. Fernando Pule. Yes? Got it. Good. Uh, and, you know, he's, he is involved in a new kind, a new approach to primary care. Uh, and that's what Tom talked about back then. Back in the 90s, Rashika was working on uh, a, a model that just gets the money management problem out of the way and lets patients and families and doctors do health care together. He's been doing it for 20 years, uh, and even in the world of hospital consulting, he led an effort at the advisory board company back in the last century, from 1999 to 2001, to create what is now known as information therapy, uh, and then gave those assets to the company health-wise. So it's a real privilege to have one of Doc Tom's actual associates here to speak, and so I, I, with that, I'll give you Rashika Fernanda Pole. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Good. So it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to Danny and the organizing committee for, uh, for asking me to come. It's great. Uh, our, I live here in Boston. Our offices are right down the road. Uh, so it's great to be here. Um, so I'm a primary care doc. And uh, when I went into medicine, this is what I imagined medicine to be, right, about uh, the doctor sitting with the patient, building a relationship, uh, you know, holding their hand. And unfortunately, when I went to practice, it looked a little more like this. And I don't know if you've all seen this picture. It's a sketch from JAMA, which I love. It's a little girl going to see her mom, with the mom going to see the doctor. And there's a doctor in the left, you know, perched over the computer trying to get their meaningful use dollars and their RVUs up and the like. Right, I think we, we have amazing, amazing technology we can offer to patients. We have really good people. The systems we've built to try and deliver that are awful. They're built completely wrong, right? And I spent a lot of my career um, uh, trying, to, trying to fix it in an incremental way and decided uh, about 20 years ago that what we need to do is simply start over, right? If the right answer is that we need to rethink how we take care of, how take care of people, uh, we may not be able to get from here to there. So let's actually build a vision where we want to go. And that's what I will talk a little bit about uh, of what we've been doing. Um, so I do this through a company called IR Health. This is a picture of our company uh, two years ago when we were about 200 people. We've doubled in size since then. The mission of IOR is to transform healthcare. And really the, the line we use is try to restore humanity, right? And that's what's really missing in healthcare in the US. We've turned healthcare in this country into a series of transactions document code bill, the doctor does stuff to patients. You know, we do more of it, the fee-for-service payment encourages that, and we need to completely change that. We need to make healthcare be about improving health, it needs to be about patients' uh, own goals for what that means, and how do we build a system. So I, the doctor, cannot manage your health. That's really silly to even think that. You, the patient, and your family are gonna manage your health, but we need to do with the health system is give you the tools to do so, right? But that ends up, if you believe that, if you really believe that, you end up with something very, very different. Um, what I, I think the right way to frame this, again, is what we need to do is get rid of the transactions and rebuild on relationships, 
right? And it's not just doctor-patient relationship. It's a whole slew of relationships that all need to change. What I wanted to center this around, this talk around, is really talk about a different, couple different levels of those relationships and what we've been doing to try and change those, right? And I think, uh, you know, it's starting here, you know, obviously with the patient and doctor, what everyone focuses on. We found that really to help people improve their health and help them uh, get their goals, we need to other human beings, particularly health coaches, as we call them, and I'll talk about that. So there's a team relationship, there's a primary care and specialists, and how do we manage that? It's inpatient, outpatient, and it's provider pair. So I want to go in backward order, right, uh, for a reason, right, because I think uh, I'll start here with sort of the payer-provider relationship. So, um, you know, the, the way we pay for healthcare in this country is by and large fee-for-service. We pay per doctor sick visit. That's all we pay for. And there's this sort of crazy coding game that goes on about 99214, 99213 that makes you check little boxes that has nothing to do with actually taking care of patients, right? Uh, our attitude, my attitude is we have to get rid of that, right? So one of my favorite quotes from Michelangelo, they asked him, how do you get the Pieta, this beautiful sculpture? He said, it's really simple. I take a block of stone and I chip away everything that's not the Pieta, right? And there you go. So healthcare, in its heart, remember back to that doctor uh, painting, is actually a beautiful thing. We've been doing it well for thousands of years. The last 50 to 100 years, we've added all this crap on, right? So what we need to do is not add more stuff. So again, all the things we're trying to do to fix healthcare, particularly payment, macro, MIPS, you know, I can't even spell these things, just make it worse, right? What we do is get rid of that and go back to it. So, so for, what we've figured out is if you don't, in the absence of payment redesign, trying to change healthcare delivery is a waste of time. Right, because you might find some people who are going to do things despite the payment model, but eventually they just get squashed or fired or whatever. So we we started with the premise we're going to change the payment model, and how do you do that? Is go upstream. So we go to the people who actually. So the dirty little secret is if you actually do healthcare right, if you actually involve patients, you focus on health. Guess what happens? You keep them out of badness, out of the hospital, out of the ER, and that saves money. <laughs> so you need to access that. So what we do is we go to the payers either through. Uh, self-insured employers, like we work with Dartmouth College for their employees, the state employees here in Massachusetts, or we uh, increasingly now go to some progressive health plans and Medicare Advantage, and we tell them, we want you to work with us and pay us a different way. And, um, and we're doing this now uh, across the country. We're, we're in about a little over two dozen practices in eight different states. Um, so just, uh, this is not a payment design talk, but, but the principle is, a lot of people talking about payment redesign and about you know, value-based payment, and most of them are still based on a fee-for-service chassis. You're still billing fee-for-service, and there are little case rates or bonuses, or every one of the CMS putative advanced payment models are, are in this category. These are the wrong, fee-for-service is the wrong way to pay for care. It doesn't allow us to do what we're doing. Stop doing it. So we're all on this, this side, where we either just get a fixed fee to pay f for primary care to pay for people, all the way up to, you know, we're so confident we can actually improve people's health and keep them out of trouble. Just give us the whole healthcare dollar and let's get on with it, right? Now, why is that really important? So we have gotten into this sort of vicious downward spiral in, I'm a primary, in primary care in particular, where we're delivering suboptimal care. We have seven minutes in a visit. We're sort of telling people what to do. You know, people come to my, in my old office. I say, you should eat less, exercise more, take your medicines. Good luck, sucker. I'll see you in three months. <laughs> and in three months, you come back, and I say, you bad, bad patient. You didn't eat less, exercise more, take your medicines. Good luck, sucker. I'll see you in three more months, right? And we... And this is what passes for, you know, patient direct, you know, patient involved care, like it's ridiculous. So, so in seven minute visits without tools, you can't do it. With suboptimal care, they end up in the hospital and in the ER because we don't really treat them. That increases healthcare costs. And what does that do? The payers then lower our, lower our rates. And we now have sick minute visits and even less time to spend with people and more hassled and the cycle goes downward, right? That is the rat hole we're in right now. And so what we have decided is we need to be in a completely different space where we're going to invest in primary care, redesign the system around what we think it ought to be. That leads to decreased downstream care, keeps people out of the hospital, out of the ER. That decreases healthcare costs. We will capture some of that value, put it back into primary care, and be able to spend more time and tools with people. Right? So now the cycle is going upward. This is why it's so important to change the payment model. Um, so uh, let's move here, inpatient, outpatient. Right? So again, what we're doing is we're fixing healthcare 
And we're starting bottom up with primary care, exactly the right place to go. Start with the patient, that's what Dr. Tom would say, start with the patient and build up. Don't, by the way, go top down. I think a lot of these ACOs, no offense to those of you in ACOs, are a waste of time where you start with a hospital and think somehow that'll trickle down to change to the actual patient, right? Start with the patient and build up. That said, you've got to make primary care a lever to influence the whole healthcare system because most of the spend goes elsewhere. A lot of it's in the hospital. So we actually try and then re-engineer the relationship between primary care and, and inpatient and outpatient. And right, this is a lot about, by the way, equalizing power dynamics, right? So the big problem in healthcare is that we have the relationships wrong, right? And there are these power dynamics where the hospital runs the, it's a top-down power dynamic, right? And the poor patient at the bottom has the least amount of power. And we need to flip that pyramid. So we flip it at every level. So here, uh, between the hospital, we, we say we are going to be advocates of the patients to co-manage with the hospital. So we're gonna help them navigate the whole system. We're gonna try really hard to avoid ER visits when we can. Uh, by improving health, but when they do need to go there, we're gonna be aggressive, we need to know when they're in there, we're gonna find a small group of hospitalists we can work with, uh, get daily notification that our patients are in the hospital, we're gonna go and visit or call with the hospital, uh, and directly discharge from there to the practice, right? This sounds easy, this is really hard, right? Something even simple, simple as, uh, as this one, this should be the easy one, is notification of when our patients are in the hospital. Right? So we, we fight this all the time. So in Las Vegas, we have some practices. Uh, and we went to the hospital and we said, look, we want to be able to take care of our people in the hospital. Uh, can you tell us when our people are in your hospital? And they said, no. <laughs> right? It's, technically, this is not hard, by the way. Right? But politically, they want, to, they want to have the data. They don't want to tell us. So what we had to do is, again, remember our trump card is we're working with the payer. So we, this was with the Casino Workers Union, 130,000 people, lives. I went in again to the hospital with the head of the Casino Workers Union. And uh, he started the conversation. How much money did we pay you last year? $52 million. Great, it seems not you know, unreasonable that we're paying you $52 million. You tell us when our patients are in your hospital. Rashik, and he said, well, I don't know, it's hard. He said, well, you know, if it's hard, we may have to pen to every single page of every chart. You'll be lucky to see your money in two years. Uh, Rashik, I asked him the question again. So I said, uh, <laughs> Can we have a list of which of my patients are in your hospital? He said, I think we can figure out how to do that. I was like, good, right? But it's about sort of evening the power dynamics here and actually making this work. So, uh, you know, and, and so, so, so does this work, by the way? So the first thing is just keep people out of the hospital, right? The U.S. healthcare system is a, is a sucking vortex, right? If you interact with it, there are all sorts of forces that are going to make you, you know, stay in the hospital, going to admit you, going to order tests. And with the other, our biggest defense is just keep you out of it. Uh, and it really works. So this is uh, in our Medicare data. This is over the first 23 months of uh, all of our practices. And this is hospital admissions per 1,000, dropping about 50%. Five zero, big number, right? Um, I play a game with myself. I walk around the wards at Mass General and I ask myself, what percentage of these people could not be here if we actually allowed them a role in their health care and actually optimize their health? And the answer is close to half, right? Um, so let's talk about primary care and specialists, right? So again, I think typically in U.S. health care, the model is that specialists are in charge and the primary care doctor is sort of at the bottom of the pyramid. You know, again, whenever a hospital builds a new office building, the primary care people end up in the basement and the high-priced specialists, the orthopedists, et cetera, are on the top floor with the nice views. So we say, no, 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 we're gonna flip this. As opposed to the specialists manage each disease and we give out flu shots, we are gonna control the patient and the job of the specialist is to be a consultant to us. And when we have a question, we will ask them and then they will send them back to us, right? It's a very different model of healthcare. Uh, so we, um, we find a small group of specialists who actually want to work that way. We call them good folks. We use the data we can find. Uh, we actually, and then we go and we meet with them when we identify people. And we say, this is how we want to work. Uh, you know, and, um, and we go speak with them. And they say, you, I want you to do the part you want to do. So for instance, uh, colonoscopies. We work with GI groups. And we say, uh, there's no reason for you to see someone before colonoscopy, right? Because you're just going to tell them what prep to do. I can do that. And you want to tell them what tests to do, I can do that. What I need from you is to stick that tube up as behind and look at the pictures, right? I can't do that. And, you do, and by the way, if that's normal, you don't, the guy doesn't need to come back to you for you to tell him it's normal. It's a waste of his time, waste of my time. I'll tell them that. Now, obviously, if he needs to get managed further, by all means, he should go, right? Um, 
this is really, really profound. In one of our practices in Atlantic City, there were 800 diabetics. 200 of them, before we got there, were being managed by an endocrinologist. Right? That's ridiculous. Um, 200 of them by an endocrinologist. Again, if you can't manage type 2 diabetes as an internist, you should hang it up. When we got done, six were being managed by endocrinologists. Right? Are there a small number of people who are very complex, brittle type 1s on pumps? Absolutely. But the vast majority, we can manage with a little bit of their help. So what we do is we arrange with the specialist, I have a question, let me ask you. He's a guy, he's on insulin, I'm having trouble with his noontime sugars, what do you suggest? There's no reason for the specialist to see that patient, right? So again, what we've done again is flip the power dynamic, if you haven't figured out, right? We are working for the patient, the specialist now works for us, right? Um, and so big drops in specialist usage. This is some data from one of our practices at Dartmouth. So 43% net drop in usage of specialists. 43, big numbers, right? And not MD specialists, so uh, other sort of ancillaries down 39%. By the way, primary care uh, encounters way up, 132%. Primary care is underused in the system, right? So this is a good trade, by the way. Um, so now I'm going to go to the meat of this, really, which is about the team, really, uh, who are seeing patients. Um, and uh, about sort of the getting the team right. Our job is, again, is not do stuff to people. Our job is how do we help patients come up with a plan and execute on their plan, right? Our job is we have a population of people. They're a responsibility. How do we help them improve their health, right? What you realize then is not about the doctor, right? What we're really good at is making plans at diagnosis and prescription. The hard part, as I mentioned, is executing. And we need other human beings to do that. And, and we call them health coaches. Uh, they are from the community. They're hired for one thing only, which is empathy, because they can connect to another human being. Because I can teach anyone the other stuff, right? And, uh, uh, and they need to be willing to learn, right? We have three health coaches per doc. Their job is to help people you know, come up with their goals. And someone made a great point in one of the prior talks. The goal is not lower A1C, right? The goal is... Um, what you, the patient, want to do, right? And then we can translate that into what the medical stuff is. I'll give you an example later. Uh, so this is one of our original teams in one of our practices in Las Vegas. Only two docs, myself and Eva. Um, everyone else are pretty much health coaches. By the way, we have no billing staff because we don't bill, right? Makes it a lot easier. Um, Chidima was a hot yoga instructor. Barbara was a um, food and beverage server at Sahara. Dennis was, worked at Target. He was a baseball coach, you know. Uh, just pick really empathetic people, work together as a team. Um, you know, we start each day off with a huddle where we sit around a table and we talk about our patients. Now again, get the relationships right and the power right. So look at this picture of our huddle, right? People say, I can't tell who the doctor is, right? The doctor does not sit at the head of the table, does not wear a white coat, does not get a private parking space, um, doesn't even run the huddle. The first thing we say every day is we all run the practice, we all run the huddle. And we take turns. So I get to run the huddle once every 12 days. But so does the health coach, so does um, the, the nurse, so does the phlebotomist. Um, it's really important, right? Get the dynamics and the power right, then it allows us to have the right dynamic with the patient, right? Now, by the way, this is not for every doctor. A lot of doctors are, I'm the captain of the ship, I want to be in charge, right? And, and what's great is we just don't hire them. Or if it turns out that's who they turn out to be, uh, we fire them. I mean, it's, it's sort of that simple, right? Because this is really important to get the culture right. Um, so again, get the culture of the team right. Teams have a lot of fun together. We sort of encourage that, and it's very much egalitarian. This is Patch Adams Day we do every day where people tell jokes and wear little red noses. The patients love it. Um, uh, so again, culture. These are what our values are, right? These are not typical healthcare values. We have these little uh, values cubes lying around in all our rooms. Uh, and the reason is we should, we should uh, live up to these values, uh, whether we're treating patients, each other, our sponsors, you know, specialists. And if you ever see someone on the team not uh, embodying the values, you take a cube and you throw it at them. And there's just hard enough that you feel it, right? But they're soft enough that they're not going to draw blood. But really, it's, it's about restoring humanity to health care. Feel empathy, bring creativity, serve with humility, act with passion, demonstrate courage, right? Not typical health care values, but for us, it's exactly the way we want to treat each other and then treat our patients. Again, I think, by the way, this team is really important. I think so much of health care, they treat each other like crap, and then some of them expect them to treat patients well. And it's not clear why they think that's true. Um, so, so let me... Finally, you know, the patient-doctor relationship, right? Getting the care right. Um, 
we do a lot of things to make sure we get this right. So first of all, we always, when, when people come in to see us, we always start and end every visit at the same level wearing clothes, right? Uh, thinking you can build a relationship with someone wearing a paper gown perched at the end of an exam table while the doctor's standing up? Come on, that's ridiculous, right? Um, so people say, wait, that's, this is inefficient. I was like, who cares about efficiency? That's not the goal of the system. The goal of the system is build the relationship, help optimize care, right? And the rest of stuff will follow. A couple other things. We also have screens here. So when we, uh, we've been doing open notes uh, for 15 years now, right? Not a big deal. We just do it. Uh, when we walk into a room, we take our laptops, we just plug it into the screen so people can see what's happening. You can, uh, you know, from home, you can log in and see your notes as well. Um, it's just the way it is, right, that we do it. Um, we have a lot of groups, right, getting patients together to learn from each other. That's a great way to empower patients, actually. It's not even using people of the care team, but actually have them empower themselves. So we call them, by the way, we don't call them groups. We call them clubs because no one wants to be in a group. Everyone wants to be in a club, right? So we have uh, diabetes clubs and Zumba clubs. And it's sort of cool. This is one of our docs, Pat Vink, who's joining in on the chair yoga club, right? And so I think it sort of models the right behavior. We do walk with the doc where you can go walking with the doctor and talk to them. We do Zumba. We do diabetes clubs. We do cooking classes. Um, and again, we don't have to perseverate over the billing stuff because we get paid for everything. But it builds the right relationships, right, and empowers patients to understand their conditions and be able to work on them. Um, really what we can do is do whatever it takes and be creative. Remember one of the things is creativity? So we, we often take our patients grocery shopping. So a health coach will take a patient and say, let's, uh, let's go to the grocery store and go pick up everything that uh, you typically get. Now let's look in your cart. What here is a bad idea because you're diabetic, right? And let's put it away and let's go find something else in your grocery store that meets your need. And why don't you take, buy it and take it home and see if you like it, right? And people say that's inefficient. One hour of shopping with people can make such an impact on how they eat, which has such an impact on their disease, which has such an impact on their, you know, whether they end up in the hospital or not, right? So we think it's a good thing. Um, you know, and uh, this is a kind of a cool story. We have hundreds of these. We had a patient, uh, what, we, what, we all, what we teach our teams is our job is not to save money in healthcare, is not even to improve health, it's actually help people improve their life, right? If we can help people improve their life, That'll improve their health. That will keep them out of the hospital. That will lower health care costs. We will capture some of that, right? But that's, that whole chain is important. So this is a patient who uh, was in one of our practices in Seattle. Uh, and uh, she had grown up in Sacramento, and uh, her husband died. Her daughter, who lived in a suburb of Seattle, said, Mom, I want you to sell the house. Come move in with me. So she sells the house in the car, moves in with the daughter. But, but the daughter lives, you know, there's no public, there's, um, she doesn't have a car. So she's sitting in the suburb of Seattle and getting isolated, right? She's watching soap opera. She's eating poorly. She's sort of getting a little depressed. Uh, she comes into the office. And, and you know, the daughter offers to give her rides, but she doesn't want to be a burden on the daughter because the daughter's got a family of her own. She comes into the practice. Uh, you know, they're talking about her in huddle. The doc says, you know, I'm really concerned about this patient. Her numbers are off whack. She says she's more medicine, and the health coach, said, Cora, he says, no, I think the problem is she's isolated. We need to get her engaged. So the social worker, we have a social worker in every practice, says, I run a club called It's My Story, where people get together and they tell their stories to each other. Uh, she would be perfect for it, right? So he said, well, she can't get here. Uh, well, we also have a partnership with Uber, where we actually can send Ubers to go pick people up and bring them to us, right? So just do the right thing, right? But he said, even better, let's teach her to ride the bus. So what Corey did the next time the club was happening is she blocked out two hours, she rode the bus out to this patient's house, gave her a bus pass, said, let's ride the bus in together. Like, rode the bus together, showed her how to do it, changed buses, came back, um, came to the club, loved it. She said, okay, now you ride the bus back yourself, but I'm right here on my cell phone. Call me if you have any problems. She rides back, she calls back. She was so proud she could ride the bus. She started coming to the club on the bus, but even better, she started going to have coffee with people she met and started going to the mall, and guess what? Her diabetes, hypertension got better, and we spent not a cent on increasing her medication. We actually cut her medications down, right? Because we engaged her, right? So this is what healthcare ought to be, right? But you need to sort of get all these relationships and power things right in order to do it. Um, so does it work? Well, patients love it. Our net promoter scores are in the sort of, you know, where you ask people how likely you to refer to this to a friend or colleague. Um, you know, most practices score really poorly. Most of healthcare scores poorly. And we're in the sort of 80 to 90% range all the time. Right? We actually track this every single week, every single practice. Why do I do that? So if I see a practice ticking down, we can immediately go in and say, what's the problem? 
right? Is there some problem with the culture? Is there some problem with the structural? And let's actually fix it, right? We care about this. We also track, by the way, team culture every week. So we can do the same thing. If we see the team culture is going bad in any practice, we can go in. You know, we, we do things, this is a little data, how often we're seen within 15 minutes. We do it 93% of the time, always or usually. Typical practices are much less. Similarly, how often do you get an answer to your medical question? 80, 88% most of the time, and much worse when they're, private, they're prior practice, right? Um, they're, you know, good case study. You, saw, you, you met Dennis in the picture from Target. This is Jose, 13-year-old kid who came to us, diabetic, 300 pounds. Uh, mom just, pediatrician just gave up on this poor kid, right? He was sitting around playing video games, eating Doritos. Uh, and uh, uh, Dennis took him on, and the key intervention, it's really simple, is, is, Jose, what do you want, right? Not do this or you will die, not you know, the usual sort of top-down thing, but ask the patient what they want. And what Jose wanted more than anything else is he wanted to make the high school football team. It's like, great, we're going to help you make the high school football team. And by the way, the side effect of that is he lost 50 pounds, his A1C was 5.3, is off his meds. But that's not the goal, right? The goal is make the football team, right? But again, put, put all those things around. Um, so we can get, you know, after being in a practice for about six months, we get close to 90% of people under blood pressure control. We do similar things with, uh, with our um, uh, diabetes control. Uh, and then, you know, this is uh, economics. This is, again, this Las Vegas practice. Uh, admissions, down this is uh, our patients. This is a control group, down 37% relative. 37% drop in admissions. That's a huge number. Uh, and total cost of care down 12%, even when you factor in the more expensive primary care. Um, so, so just to close, uh, you know, we don't have that much time. I think if we are serious about actually building truly patient-centered and patient-involved care, I am fed up of the excuses why this is going to take a long time or why we can't do it, is we should just do it and just start building systems that uh, just start building systems uh, that actually do the right thing. But I think the, the hidden thing that no one talks about is power, right? So that the thing we need to do in order to make all this work is pay attention to these power dynamics and explicitly flip them, right? At every level, payer, provider, hospital, outpatient, specialist, primary care, uh, doctor, patient, team. If we can change those, right? So people spend way too much time focusing on technology and even payment and process and medical home criteria and meaningful use, all hokum, right? Focus on the relationship, focus on the power, get those right, and all the rest of it will follow. So thank you. I don't know if we have time for some questions. Of course. Yes, we, uh, we have about 10 minutes. Dr. Del Banco, I've never seen you so actively involved in a meeting. <laughs> this is, but this is great. I mean, that paper that he talked about from 20 years ago, the people have been tweeting about healthcare in a land called people power. They wrote about this in Salzburg, about the families actually helping run the hospitals, being in the halls and so on. So this man's vision, it's a privilege to have you here, and I don't often talk that way. So what do you want to say? <laughs> What do you want, David? <laughs> Change. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to have Rushika here, and I've, I've watched him since he was a kid. Yes. And um, the question for you is, why aren't you at scale? Why, why is it still little pods and corners? What is there in the power dynamic? It's a totally rational story. And your figures imply success in that magical world called value, which one all has to talk about now. Value, right, is quality divided by cost. Yep. And, you, and you show nice little graphs all going in the right direction. So I know it's an irrational world, but if it were a rational world, why, why wouldn't your map be full of Rashikas cloned everywhere? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. So why, why this just seems like so obvious, why did this happen? And I've been doing this for a long time, as Tom knows. I think I first came to talk to you about this 20 years ago. Uh, so, so part A of the answer is that um, there are an awful lot of people in the healthcare system who actually benefit from keeping things exactly the way they are, sort of pigs feeding at the trough, 
you know, that uh, the hospitals make money from filling hospital beds. Doctors make money from doing more tests and doing more visits. The pharma companies make more money from selling more drugs. Uh, uh, the health plans, despite the rhetoric, make a percentage off the top, a percentage of a bigger number is a bigger number. The brokers who sell to employers make a percentage off the total spend, right? So, so there's virtually no one in the system except the poor patients who actually want this to change, right? So that's point one. Point two is, uh, and, and it's, it's a system is so tied up that you have to sort of get permission of some of these people to do it. So what we've had to do is sort of find little niches and find places where we can actually align things well. Second is this takes time. And I think people in healthcare are just very impatient, right? So if the goal here at fundamental is you're changing how actual people get actual care, you're changing the health trajectory and that influences costs and you're going to make, you're going to capture some of that, that doesn't take three months or six months. That takes years, right? Not even one year. That takes two or three years. It just is what it is. And we have this sort of great impatience. Even the good funders, you go to a foundation, six months later, they're asking you, well, where are your results? You're like, come on, we just started this, right? We have to build the team. We have to build the relationship. We have to sort of work on the plans. You know, these things take time. So I think there's just this big time bias in our system to do it. Uh, you know, we ended up, uh, maybe why are we still standing? <laughs> because many people have tried this and failed. And the other is we just have, uh, we've been able to attract some capital, right? So this takes money. Uh, and we've been able to attract some really great folks to give us enough capital, to give us a long enough leash to be able to keep doing this, right? So I think, uh, I, have, I feel like the tide is turning. I think there are things that are happening now in the market with consumers actually voting more with their feet. I think with sort of the move to value-based care, I think the move to digitalization makes a lot of this stuff easier. I'm confident that in the next five or 10 years, this will become much more dominant. And again, I think a lot of players in the healthcare system, oh, well, healthcare is different. We won't be disrupted, you know. But you look at Blockbuster Video and Kodak and a bunch of other things is, you know, things are really slow until they're not. <laughs> and I think consumers voting with their feet is the only thing that will change healthcare. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I hope so. I hope that'll happen soon. Hi, uh, Rishika. Thanks so much for what, for what you're doing and really changing this culture and the power dynamic. And I have a, a brief comment that leads into a question and a suggestion of where I think you should go next. <laughs> Um, so we're learning more and more about life course medicine, about what happens in childhood affects you later on. Um, everyone, a lot of people have heard about the effects of ACEs, the adverse yep. childhood experiences. But what's really exciting is we're learning a lot more about resilience. Um, we're learning about what kinds of positive experiences lead to help a child who's suffered trauma to actually be resilient yep. and not have that be a problem. And we think of our healthcare system as a pediatric healthcare system from zero to 18, an adult healthcare system that's primarily 40 and above, especially for males, um, and really this 18 to 35, that bridge, really where there's no form, formalized form of healthcare system is this bridge from the pediatric to the adult healthcare system where many of these lifestyle changes happen at the end of college for most males who are relatively healthy, that's where you're starting to develop a lot of your bad habits that will turn into yep. disease later on. Yet there's no formal system of care there. And so with all of our understanding of life course medicine, um, really thinking about what happens at a younger age leading to later on, um, where do you see Iora addressing that and really kind of shifting where we put our money because the pediatric healthcare system, the amount we spend is basically a rounding error on what we spend in the adult healthcare system. So, yeah, so, um, so, yeah, so great, that's what I to Great, ask. great question. So, so, so part of the problem here is we have an irrational healthcare funding system, right, where uh, if we actually had a structure where anyone cared about the lifetime cost of a patient, we would do exactly what you suggest. Mm -hmm. The problem is investments in certainly pediatric, but even in the 18 to 35 year old thing, the payoffs are decades later, not years later, decades later, and trying to figure out how to get that funding stream to work in our current system is almost impossible. We were sitting in the UK right now, it's an easy discussion, right? Because these people will still be your problem uh, for a while. We, have, we can find these little niches where you find people, so we work with a carpenters union in Boston. And if you're a carpenter in Boston, you will be a carpenter in Boston till you check out the other end, right? So there we can actually start justifying making investments in the 20-something-year-old carpenters because there will still be a problem for the carpenters union 
when they're 50, right? But I think those are very small niches with our stupid employment-based um, healthcare system to be able to make those. Um, the, the other thing, I agree with you. I think that, you know, we were one of the original hotspotters that Tool wrote about in the article. I now think that hotspotting is not the biggest opportunity in U.S. healthcare because the horse is sort of out of the barn, right? The biggest opportunity is preventing people from becoming those people. Uh, and that doesn't happen at age 50 or 60. It happens at age 20 or 30. We are struggling to figure out how we get a funding mechanism that, that allows those investments in sort of a rational way. Thank you so yeah. much. Try not to. Um, I'm actually one of those pediatric group Good. people. I'm a little <laughs> bit older, but um, I have a child who is medically complex and has probably 20 or 25 specialists at Boston Children's Hospital. The great thing about her is, besides being really complex, is that she has me as a mom. Um, and I'm, I'm on top of them, right? Like, Good. I am her e-caregiver, e-patient. I, I don't know. I, I run the show, and I run the team. Um, we voted doctors off our teams, and we said, thank you, you're not sticking around um, for different reasons, but mostly because they're not collaborating yep. and sort of moving with us in the system. And I guess I, I wonder, she's one of those kids that runs the risk of being expensive to healthcare herself, and most recently to me as well, because I had to have shoulder surgery because I carry her because she doesn't walk on her own. And so how are you able to look at sort of not just a single impact, you know, healthcare, but now sort of the family effect, especially in cases where we have kids, parents, caregiving sort of across the continu continuum? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. We, we had a brief shining uh, example of it. So we keep trying to find places where we can work. We, uh, uh, when the exchanges seem like a good idea, uh, we had a great product we built called Harkin Health. It's a conjunction with a sort of a a secret startup within United Healthcare to build plans for whole families that would uh, combine our primary care practices at the front end with sort of a consumer-centric back-end plan, uh, work really well. And then we would take the whole family, we would take care of the kid who might be complex, but also the parents, and it really worked. Unfortunately, what happened is, you all know, the exchange has collapsed, right? And I think the current administration is, you know, uh, I don't know what the right word is, 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 uh, is doing its level best to kill them despite it still being the law of the land, right? So we ended up having to pull out of that because it just doesn't make sense. Um, I agree, just like I think uh, our crazy financing system, one problem is we can't take care of people birds to death, we also can't take care of families. Because often, particularly once people get older, they're, they're covered by different people. By the way, other crazy things, why dental, why the teeth are separate than the rest of the body, and, there's, and then there's all these mental health carve-outs, why the mind is separate from the rest of the body, and somehow we can't talk to each other because of some privacy. Right, so we have all sorts of huge structural problems of how we structure the way we do healthcare that, that doesn't make sense. But we try to find ways to demonstrate it. Um, we're about out of time. Uh, do you have a quick thing, or do you want to tackle him when he gets off stage? <laughs> I just, well, I, all right, uh, by popular demand. Here. <laughs> this is, it, it's rough running a society like this, but if you want to listen to the stakeholders, you can. <laughs> I, I feel so heard, thank you. So, um, so I am actually a specialist, and I'm a female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, and I see almost every single patient I ever see has a multi-organ problem. It's prolapse, there's colorectal surgery or GI involved, um, but the most difficult population is the pelvic pain patients. Not only have, do they have um, maybe neurology, psych, uh, GI, um, urinary issues, uh, dyspareunia issues such as that, but they also have seen six providers before and they've really been shunned by the system. By this point, they may have an addiction. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. And so um, I built a program in Albany where we uh, pre-documented the patients to make them more palatable to the physicians who were seeing people with this many records, and we also had a nurse navigator and a social worker handling the patients. Um, now I'm working in Boston, and I am, again, primary care provider, because my primaries have seven minutes to see the patient, and I'm the social worker, and it takes 90 minutes. And I can afford it because of the urodynamics, but not really. So, um, 
you know, the system is such an uphill battle, and it, what you're doing is beautiful, and of course I'd love to have someone ride the bus with my patient, but it is, um, to get from here to there in the current system is, it, it really seems overwhelming. Yeah, so maybe we need big change and not little change, right? So I think to me the lesson is uh, the distance, you know, the, the quality chasm report 15 years ago, the gap between where we are and where we need to be is not a gap but a chasm. And thinking we can cross that chasm in tiny little steps, maybe we need to sort of make a big leap. The economics, we have plenty of money in the system. Right? We spend an obscene amount of money in healthcare in the US and we can take some of that and spend time riding buses, summarizing records, doing all the right things. That money will work out, I am completely confident, but it requires sort of being courageous enough to do big change. But the amount of, the amount of time, my 90 minutes with that patient saves the insurance company tens of thousands of dollars correcting yep. in the last five years of care. Yep. And it's totally not compensated. Yeah, so in our model it is, because it's all our money. Right, so that's exactly why we did it that way. So now when we save that patient out of the hospital, it's our money and we can now invest that in more health coaches and teaching people to ride the bus. So it changes the economic model. So thank you. So, yes, so the, uh, the subject here was rebalancing power in the clinical relationship, which is a great tee up for the next panel, which is about shared decision making. Thank you so much. For thank you. <laughs>